The Continued Story of Taryn, the Assistant Pig Keeper. I'm glad you stayed to listen. Now sit round as Papa Bear reads a story. Chapter 3 The Shoemaker. Taryn paled, his head still whirled at seeing the Prince of Dawn in the guise of a shoemaker, and Gwydion's words left him all the more confused. Are lives in danger? he asked hurriedly. Does Auron of Anuvan seek us as far as Dinas Ridnaunt? Gwydion motioned for Gurji to stand guard at the portal, and turned once more to Terran. No, said Gwydion with a quick shake of his head. Though Auron's wrath has grown to fury since the Black Cauldron was destroyed, the threat comes not from Anuvan. Terran frowned. Then who? There is none in Dinas Ridnaunt who wishes us ill. You cannot mean that King Rudlam or Queen Teleria. The House of Rudlam has always borne friendship to the Sons of Dawn, and to our High King Math, replied Gwydion. Look elsewhere, Terran of Caradalban. But who would harm Elenwy? Terran asked urgently. It is known she is under Dalbin's protection. There is one who would dare to stand against Dalbin, Gwydion said. One against whom my own powers may not suffice, and whom I fear as much as Auron himself. Gwydion's face was taut, and his green eyes flickered with deep anger as he spoke one harsh word. Akron. Terran's heart chilled. No, that evil enchantress is dead. So I too believed, Gwydion answered. It is not true. Akron lives. She has not rebuilt Spiral Castle, Terran cried, his thoughts flashing to the dungeon where Akron had held him prisoner. Spiral Castle still lies in ruins, as you left it, Gwydion said. And grass already covers it. Uith Anuith, where Akron would have given me to death, no longer stands. I have journeyed to those places and seen with my own eyes. You must know that I have long pondered her fate, Gwydion went on. Of Akron there has not been the slightest sign, as though the earth had swallowed her. This troubled me and lay heavily on my heart and I have never given up seeking ra traces of her. And I have never given up seeking traces of her. At last, I found those traces, said Gwydion. They were faint, as though words whispered in the mind, puzzling rumors that seemed at first no more than imaginings, a senseless riddle without an answer. Perhaps, Gwydion continued, I should say an answer without a riddle and it was only after long toil and hard journeying that I discovered part of that riddle. Alas, only a part. Gwydion's voice lowered. As he spoke, his hands did not cease carving and shaping the unfinished sandal. What I have learned is this. After Spiral Castle fell, Akron vanished. At first I believed that she had sought refuge in the realm of Anuvan, for she had lived long as a consort of Auron. Indeed, it was Akron who gave Auron his power in the days when she herself ruled Prydane. But she did not go to Anuvan, since she had let the sword Durnwin slip from my hands and failed to take my life. It may be that she feared Auron's wrath. Perhaps she dared not face him, having been outwitted by a young girl and an assistant pigkeeper. Of this I am not certain. Nevertheless, she fled Prydane. Since then, no man knows what has befallen her. Yet even to know she is alive is cause enough for fear. Do you think she's on Mona? Taran asked. Does she seek vengeance on us? But Elenu was no more than a child when she escaped from Akron. She understood nothing of what she did. Wittingly or not, by taking Durnwin from Spiral Castle, Elenu gave Akron her most grievous defeat, Gwydion said. Akron does not forget or forgive. He knit his brows. It is my fear that she seeks Elenwy, not only for revenge. I sense there is something other than that. It is hidden from me now, yet I must discover it without delay. More than Elenwy's life may hang in the balance. If only Dolbin had let her stay with us, Terran said in dismay. He too must have known Akron was alive. Did he not realize Elenwy would be in danger the moment she was beyond his protection? Dolbin's ways are deep, said Gwydion, and not always given to me to fathom. He knows much, but he foresenses more than he chooses to tell. Gwydion put down his awl, drew out a leather thong, and began stitching it through the sandal. 
Dolben sent me word that the Princess Eleni would voyage to Mona, and counseled me to turn my attention here. He told me, too, of certain other matters, but it is better not to speak of them now. I cannot sit idly while Eleni may be in peril, Taryn insisted. Is there no way I can serve you? You shall serve me best by keeping silent, Gwydion answered. Stay watchful. Say nothing of me or of what we have spoken. Not to the princess, Elenry, not even to Fluter. He smiled. Our eager bard saw me in the stables and luckily did not know me. Meantime, I shall... Before the Prince of Dawn could finish, Gurji began waving his arms in warning. Footsteps rang in the corridor, and Gwydion bent quickly to the task of fitting the sandals. Hello, hello, cried Prince Run, striding into the chamber. Ah, Shoemaker, there you are. Have you done with your work? I say, they are handsome, aren't they? He said, glancing at the sandals. Amazingly well made. I should like a pair myself. Oh, my mother asks to see you in the great hall, he added, turning to Terran. Gwydion's face had fallen suddenly into lines and wrinkles. His shoulders were hunched, and his voice shook with age. Without a further glance at Terran, Gwydion beckoned to run. Come with me, young prince, he said. You shall have sandals befitting your station. As Ka fluttered after him, Terran hurried from the chamber and went down the corridor. Gurji, round-eyed with fright, trotted beside Gurji, round-eyed with fright, trotted beside him. Oh, fearsome danger! Gurji moaned. Gurji is sorry great enchanter sends us to place of peril. Gurji wants to hide his poor tender head under kindly straw at Kerdalbin. Terran warned him to silence. Elenwi is surely in more danger than we are, he whispered, hastening toward the great hall. I don't like the thought of Akron turning up again any more than you do, but Gwydion is here to protect Elenwi, and so are we. Yes, yes, cried Gurji. Brave, loyal Gurji will guard golden-haired princess, too. Oh, yes, and she'll be safe with him. But, he snuffled, he still longs to be at Cardalbin. Take heart, my friend, Terran said. He smiled and put a hand on Gurji's trembling shoulder. We companions shall see no ill befalls any of us. But remember, not a word that Gwydion is here. He has his own plans, and we must do nothing to betray them. Gurji will be silent, Gurji cried, clapping his hands to his mouth. Oh, yes, but mind, he added, shaking a finger at Ka. That gossipy black bird does not tell with talkings and squawkings. Rah! Silence! Ka croaked, bobbing his head. Secrets! In the high-ceilinged great hall, with its flagstones that seemed to cover a space as large as the orchard at Caradalban, Terran caught sight of Elenry amid a group of court ladies. Some of Elenry's age were listening delightedly to the princess, the rest, all of whom looked much like Queen Teleria, were frowning or whispering behind their hands. Mag, standing behind the queen's throne, watched impassively. And there we stood, Elenry was saying, her eyes flashing. Back to back, sword in hand, the huntsmen of Anuvan burst from the forest. They were upon us in a moment. The young girls of the court gasped with excitement, while some of the older women gave horrified cluckings that reminded Terran of nothing so much as Call's chicken run. Terran saw that Elenry wore a new cloak. Her hair had been combed and dressed in a different fashion. Among the ladies, she shone like a bird of golden plumage, and... With a curious twinge of heart, Terran realized that it had not been. Terran realized that had it not been for her chattering, he might not have known her. Good Lear, cried Queen Teleria, who had leaped from her throne as Elenry continued the tale of battle. I'm beginning to think you haven't had a... My dear child, don't be so gleeful when you talk about hacking at people with swords. Safe moment in your life. She blinked, shook her head, and fanned herself with a kerchief. What relief that Dolbin has finally decided to be sensible and send you to us. If nothing else, you'll be out of harm's way. Terran caught his breath, and it took all his strength to force himself not to shout Gwydion's warning aloud. Ah, there you are, Queen Teleria cried, spying Terran. I had thought to speak to you about... That's right, young man, step up, briskly. Bow a little more deeply if you can, and Gwydion, don't scowl so. The royal feast tonight. You shall be pleased to know that, in honor of all of you, we're planning to invite a perfectly wonderful bard, who claims to be a bard, that is, and who claims, by the way, to know you. The self-styled bard, 
said Mag, with ill-concealed distaste at the mention of Fluter, has already been commanded to present himself at the feast. Therefore, in the matter of new garments, Teleria went on, you had better go with Mag immediately and find some. That has been seen to as well, Lady Teleria, murmured the chief steward, handing Terran a neatly folded cloak and jacket. Wonderful, Teleria cried. All that remains to be done is, well, I do believe everything has been done. I suggest then, Terran of Caradalbin, that you go and make yourself, don't frown so, you'll look old before your time, ready. Terran hardly had finished bowing to Queen Teleria when Elenwy seized him and Gurji by the arms and hastily drew them away. You've seen Fluter, of course, she whispered. Now it's getting to be more like old times. What a blessing to have him here. I've never met such silly women. Why, I don't think there's one of them that's ever drawn a sword. All they want to talk about it is sewing and embroidery and weaving and how to run a castle. The ones who have husbands are always complaining about having them, and the ones who haven't are always complaining about the lack of them. They've never been out of Dinus Ridnaught in their lives. I told them a thing or two about some of our adventures. Not the best ones, so I'm saving those for later, when you can be there to tell your part as well. What we'll do, Eleni hurried on, her eyes sparkling. After the feast, when no one's watching, we'll get hold of Fluter and go exploring for a few days. They'll never miss us. There's so many people coming and going around here. There's bound to be a few adventures on Mona. But we certainly won't find them in this stupid castle. Now, first thing... You must look out a sword for me. I wish I'd brought one from Caradalbin. Not that I think we'll need swords, but it's better to have them just in case. Gurji, of course, shall bring along his wallet of food. Elenwy, Terran interrupted. This cannot be. How's that? asked Elenwy. Oh, very well. You needn't bother with swords, then. We'll just go adventuring as we are. She hesitated. What's the matter with you? I must say. You have the strangest expression on your face from time to time. Right now, you look as if a mountain were about to fall on your head. As I was saying. Ellen Wee, Terran said firmly, you are not to leave Dinus Ridnaunt. Ellen Wee, so surprised, she stopped talking for a moment, stared at him, open-mouthed. What? she cried. What did you say? Not leave the castle? Terran of Caradolben, I think the salt air must have pickled your wits. Listen to me. Terran said gravely, searching his mind for some means to warn the startled girl without revealing Gwydion's secret. Dinus Ridnaunt is unfamiliar to us. We know nothing of Mona. There may be dangers that we... Dangers? cried Eleni. You can be sure of that, and the biggest is that I'll be bored to tears. Don't think for an instant I mean to wear out my days in this castle. You of all people, tell me I'm not to go adventuring. What really is the matter with you? I'm ready to believe you dropped your courage over the side of Run's ship, along with the anchor stone. It is not a question of courage, Terran began. It is the better part of wisdom, too. Now you're talking about wisdom, Ellen we cried. Before that was the last thing in the world you thought about. This is different, Terran said. Can you not understand? He pleaded. Though he saw clearly from Ellen Wee's face that his words made no sense to her. For an instant, he was tempted to blurt out the truth. Instead, he took the girl by the shoulders. You are not to set foot outside of this palace, he ordered angrily. And if I think you have any idea of doing so, I shall ask King Rudlam to set a guard over you. What? cried Eleni. How dare you? Tears suddenly filled her eyes. Yes, I do understand. You're glad I've been sent to this wretched island in these clucking hens. You couldn't wait for a chance to be rid of me. You actually want me to stay here and be lost in this dreadful castle? That's worse than putting someone's head in a sack of feathers. Sobbing, Ellen we stamped her foot. Terran of Caradalbin, I am not speaking to you anymore. Chapter 4 Shadows The feast that evening was surely the merriest the castle had ever seen. Ka perched on the back of Terran's chair, bobbed up and down and looked as if the banquet had been arranged entirely in his honor. King Rudlam beamed with good spirits. The talk and laughter of the guests rang through the great hall. Behind the long table, crowded with Queen Teleria's ladies of the court, Mag flitted back and forth, snapping his fingers, whispering commands to servitors, bearing endless dishes of food and flagons of drink. For Terran, it was a waking a nightmare. He sat silent and uneasy, his repast untouched. You needn't look so gloomy, said Eleni. After all, you aren't the one who has to stay here. If I'm trying to make the best of things, I might say you're not exactly healthy. 
I want to remind you I'm not speaking to you after the way you behaved today. Without waiting to hear Terran's confused protests, Elenui tossed her head and began chattering to Prince Ron. Terran bit his lip. He felt as though he were shouting a voiceless warning. While well, Elenui, all unwitting, raced gaily toward the brink of a cliff. Fluter tuned his harp, stepped to the middle of the hall, and sang his new lay. Terran listened without pleasure, although he realized it was the best Fluter had yet composed. When the bard had done, and King Rudlum had begun to yawn, the guests rose from their seats at the table. Terran plucked Fluter's sleeve and drew him aside. I've been thinking about the stables, Terran asked anxiously. No matter what Mag says, it's not a fitting place for you to sleep. I'll speak to King Rudlum, and I'm sure he'll order Mag to give you back your chamber in the castle. Terran hesitated. I... I think somehow it would be better if we were all together. We are strangers here and know nothing of the ways of this place. Great Beelin, don't give yourself a moment's concern about that, replied the bard. For my part, I prefer the stables. Indeed, that's one reason I go wandering, to get away from stuffy, dreary castles. Besides, he added behind his hand, it would lead to trouble with Mag, and if he pushes me beyond endurance, there will be swordplay. A flame is hot-headed, which is hardly courteous behavior from a guest. No, no. We shall all be fine and meet again in the morning. So saying, Fluter shouldered his harp, waved good night and made his way from the hall. Something tells me we should keep an eye on the castle, Terran said to Gurji. He put a forefinger under Ka's feet and set the bird on Gurji's shoulder, where the crow immediately began running his beak through Gurji's matted hair. Stay close to Elenui's chamber, he went on. I'll join you soon. Keep Ka with you, and send him to me if anything seems amiss. Gurji nodded. Yes, yes, he whispered. Loyal Gurji will stand with watchful waitings. He will guard dreamful drowsings of noble princess. Unnoticed among the departing guests, Terran walked to the courtyard, hoping to find Quidian. He strode quickly toward the stables. Stars filled the clear night sky, and a bright moon hung above the crags of Mona. In the stables, Terran discovered no trace of the Prince of Dawn, but came only upon Fluter, curled up in the straw his arm flung around his harp and already snoring peacefully. Terran turned once more to the castle, which had by now fallen into darkness. He stood a moment, wondering where else he might seek. Hello, hello! Prince Run burst from around a corner at such a rate he nearly sent Terran sprawling. Still awake, are you? So am I. My mother says it's good for me to take a little stroll before sleeping. I suppose you're doing the same. Very good. We shall walk and talk together. That we shall not, Terran retorted. Now of all times he had no wish to be hindered by the feckless prince. I I seek the tailors, he added quickly. Where are they lodged? You're looking for tailors, Ron asked. How odd. Whatever for? My jacket, Terran hurriedly answered. It fits me badly. I must ask them to fix it. In the middle of the night, asked Ron, his moon face puzzled. Now that really is surprising. He pointed toward a shadowed side of the castle. Their chambers are down there, but I shouldn't think they'd be in a humor to stitch well if you rouse them up out of sleep. Tailors can be touchy, you know. I advise you to wait until morning. No, it must be done now, Terran said, impatient to be rid of Ron. The prince shrugged, wished him a cheerful good night, and trotted off again. Terran made his way toward a cluster of sheds beyond the stable. His search there was also in vain. Discouraged, he had decided to rejoin Gurji when he stopped suddenly. A figure was moving quickly across the courtyard, not toward the main portal, but to the farthest angle of the heavy stone wall. Could Elenui have slipped away from Gurji? Terran was about to call out, then, fearful of waking the castle, he hurried after the figure. An instant later, it seemed to disappear completely. Terran pressed on. At the wall, he stumbled upon a narrow opening, barely wide enough to squeeze through. Terran plunged through the curtain of ivy concealing it and found himself beyond the castle, on a rocky slope overlooking the harbor. The figure, Terran realized suddenly, was not Elenui. Too tall, the gait different. He cut his breath as the cloaked shape turned, once for a furtive glance at the castle, and the moonlight glittered for a moment over its features. It was Mag. Spider-like, the chief steward was rapidly picking his way down a path. In a surge of fear and suspicion, Terran clambered blindly over the jagged stones, trying his best 
to be both swift and silent. Despite the clear night, the way was difficult to follow. Boulders loomed to catch him unawares and break his stride. He longed for the light of Elenwee's bobble as he scrambled headlong after Mag toward the sleeping harbor. Mag had come to level ground and well ahead of Terran and was scuttling along the sea wall until, at the far end, he reached a huge pile of rocks. With surprising agility, the chief steward swung himself up, crawled over, and once more dropped out of sight. Casting caution aside, fearful he would lose track of Mag, Terran broke into a run. Along the wall, moonbright water lapped and whispered. A shadow moved for an instant among the stilted piers. In alarm, Terran checked his pace, then hastened on. His eyes were playing tricks. Even the rocks themselves seemed to rise up before him like crouching, threatening beasts. Gritting his teeth, Terran climbed the dark barrier of rocks. Below, the water churned in glittering eddies and foamed among the stones. The surf rang in his ears as he hauled himself to the crest. There he clung, not daring to follow further. Mag had stopped not many paces beyond, at the edge of a narrow spit of land. Terran saw him kneel and make a rapid motion. In another instant, a light flared. The chief steward had lit a torch and now raised it overhead, moving the flickering flame slowly back and forth. As Terran watched, fearful and puzzled, a tiny point of orange light glowed far seaward. This answering signal, Terran judged, could come only from a ship, though he could make out nothing of the vessel's shape or distance. Mag waved the torch again, in a different pattern. The light from the ship repeated it, then winked out. Mag thrust his torch into the black water where it sputtered and died. He turned and strode quickly toward the tumble of rocks, where Terran lay. Terran, left blinking in the sudden darkness, sought to clamber down before Mag could come upon him, but could find no foothold. In panic, he groped for a jetting stone below him, slipped, caught vainly for another one. He could hear Mag scrabbling up the far side and let himself fall among the rocks. Wincing at the sharp pain, he tried to hide in the shadows. Mag's head had just appeared at the crest when Terran was seized firmly from behind. Terran snatched at his sword. A hand was clapped over his mouth, stifling his shout, and he was dragged rapidly toward the foaming wavelets to be flung silently down amid the stones. Make no sound, Gwydion's voice whispered the command. Terran went limp with relief. Overhead, Mag lowered himself from the massive stones and passed no more than a dozen paces from the two crouching figures. Gwydion, clinging to the rocks above the surf, motioned for Terran to stay hidden. The chief steward, without a backward glance, hastened once more along the seawall, heading for the castle. Seize him, Terran urged. A ship rides at anchor. I saw him signal it. We must make him tell us what he is about. Gwydion shook his head. His green eyes followed the retreating mag, and his lips drew tightly against his teeth in the lean smile of a stalking wolf. He still wore the rags of the shoemaker, but Durnwin, the black sword, now hung at his belt. Let him go, he murmured. The game is not played out. But the signal, Terran began. Gwydion nodded. I too saw it. I have been keeping watch over the castle since I left you. Though a moment ago... He added with some severity, I feared an assistant pig-keeper would stumble into a snare set to catch a traitor. Would you serve me? The return at once to the castle. Stay close by the princess. Dare we let Mag go unhindered? Terran asked. He must go unhindered for a time at least, replied Gwydion. The shoemaker will soon put down his all and take up the sword. Until then, keep silent. I would not spoil Mag's scheme before I learn more of it. The fisherfolk of Mona have already told a curious and harmless shoemaker part of what he must know, Gwydion continued. Enough to be certain of one thing. Akron is aboard that vessel. Yes, Gwydion went on as Terran drew a sharp breath. This much I suspected. Akron herself would not dare strike directly against Elenui. The castle is strong and well guarded. Only treachery could open its gates. Akron needed a hand to do her bidding. Now... I know whose it is. Gwydion frowned deeply as he spoke on. But why? He murmured almost to himself. Too much still remains hidden. If it is as I fear... He shook his head quickly. It 
does not please me to use El Enemy as unwitting bait for a trap, but I cannot do otherwise. Mag can be watched, Terran said, but what of Akron? I must find some means to learn her plan as well as Mag's, replied Gwydion. Go quickly now, he ordered. Soon all may grow clear, so I hope, for I would not see the Princess Elemy long in peril. Terran hastened to obey Gwydion's command, leaving the Prince of Dawn to the harbor. He made his way with all speed up the winding path to the castle, found the opening in the wall, and pressed through it into the dark courtyard. Elenwy, he knew, would not be safe so long as Mag had the freedom of the castle. But Mag, at least, could be watched. The terror that chilled Terran's heart came from the ship waiting in the night. Memory of Akron, beautiful and merciless, again returned to him. From a day long past, he recalled her livid face. Her voice that had spoken so softly of torment and death. It was her shadow that loomed behind the treacherous chief steward. He hurried silently across the courtyard. A dim light shone from one of the chambers. Stealthily, Terran moved toward it, raised himself on tiptoe, and peered through the casement. In the glow of an oil lamp, he saw the chief steward. Mag clutched a long dagger, which he brandished in the air, all the while making fierce grimaces. After a time, he hid the weapon in his garments, then picked up a small looking glass, into which he smiled, pursed his lips, and eyed himself with glances of deep satisfaction. Terran watched with rage and horror, hardly able to keep himself from bursting in upon him. With a final smirk, the chief steward put out the lamp. Terran clenched his fists, turned away, and entered the castle. At Elenry's chamber, he found Gurji, crouched on the flagstones. Rumpled and half asleep, Gurji blinked and sprang to his feet. Ka, as tousled as Gurji himself, popped his head from under his wing. All is quiet, Gurji whispered. Yes, yes, watchful Gurji has not moved from portal. Valiant, sleepy Gurji keeps noble princess from harmful hurtings. His poor tender head is heavy, but it does not nod. Oh, no. You have done well, Terran said. Sleep, my friend. Go and rest that poor tender head of yours, and I shall stay here until daylight. While Gurji, yawning and rubbing his eyes, crept down the corridor, Terran took his place before the chamber. He sank to the flagstones and, with hand on sword, rested his head on his knees, and fought against his own weariness. Once or twice, despite his efforts, he drowsed, then started up suddenly. The vaulted corridor slowly lightened in the rising dawn. With relief, Terran saw the first rays of morning, and at last allowed himself to close his eyes. Terran of Caradalbin! He stumbled to his feet and clutched his blade. Elenry, looking fresh and well-rested, stood in the doorway. Terran of Caradalbin! she declared. I nearly tripped over you. Whatever in the world are you doing? Befuddled, Terran could only stammer that he found the hallway more comfortable than his chamber. Elenry shook her head. That! she remarked, is the silliest thing I've heard this morning. I may hear something sillier because it's early yet, but I doubt it. I'm beginning to think the ways of assistant pig keepers are quite beyond me. She shrugged. In any case, I'm going to breakfast. After you wash your face and untangle your hair, you might have some too. It would do you good. You look as jumpy as a frog with fleas. Without waiting for Terran to shake the sleep from his head, and before he could stop her, Elenry disappeared down the corridor. Terran hurried after her. Even in the bright morning, he felt shadows cling to him like black spider webs. By now, he hoped Quidian had discovered Akron's plan, but Mag still went free. Terran, recalling the chief steward's hidden dagger, had no intention of letting Elenry out of his sight for an instant. Hello, hello! His round face glowing as if he had just scrubbed it, Prince Run popped out of his chamber just as Terran passed by. Going to breakfast? cried the prince, clapping Terran on the shoulder. Good, so am I. Then we shall meet in the great hall, Terran hastily replied, striving to shake himself loose from Run's friendly grasp. Amazing how one's appetite grows during the night, Prince Run went on. Oh, by the way, did you ever manage to rouse the tailors? Tailors? Terran asked impatiently. What tailors? Oh, yes, yes, they have done what I asked, he quickly added, peering down the corridor. Splendid! cried Run. I wish I had the same good fortune. Do you know that shoemaker never did finish my sandals? 
he'd only just begun, then off he went, and that was the end of them. It may be that he had a more important task to do, Taren replied. As do I. What could be more important than a shoemaker making shoes? asked Run. However, he snapped his fingers. Ah, I knew there was something. I've forgotten my cloak. Hold on, I shall only be a moment. Prince Run, Taren cried. I must join Princess Elenwy. We shall be there directly, called Run from the chamber. Oh, drat, there goes my sandal lace broken. I do wish that shoemaker had finished his work. Leaving the Prince of Mona still rummaging in the chamber, Taren sped anxiously to the great hall. King Rudlam and Queen Teleria were already at table, and the queen, surrounded as always by her ladies. Taren looked quickly about him. Mag, usually in attendance, was not there. Nor was there any sign of Elenby. This concludes Chapter 4. Thank you for listening. And remember, have a good day. You deserve it.